And um, I just have a oh, comment and a question. Uh, my comment is, I think the anti-war movement is very pro-military because um, I think you would agree that we don't send our military out willy-nilly into these um, aggressive uh, arenas. When we follow the Constitution, we protect our military. And, and I think the anti-war movement is very much, at least Ron Paul, there, and you're a part of that, that libertarian mindset, is that we need to defend this country. And, and, and the military is just obeying orders. I mean, we certainly, we applaud them, we honor them, um, but they also need, our military needs to be protected by not allowing them to go without careful, deliberate thought into these arenas that we probably have no business being in. Okay, that's one thing. Another thing is, um, you know, I used to be a big Fox News person until Ron Paul, and my eyes were opened that there is this stupid right left they keep us at each other but everybody kind of is on the same team and we're kind of the pawns but um, I've ha tried to have a, a talk about um, my husband. I tried to have a talk about, about the um, um, about our foreign policy with relatives and friends and it's almost like you're and I think this is how some of the young people reacted today you're un-American that's not patriotic so could you um, explain the difference between patriotism and nationalism? Oh boy. Do you want another three hour lecture on George Washington and interventionism and whatever? I don't think so. Look, I mean, I don't know. I mean, didn't we get over this in the 60s? I mean, you know, this whole kind of, it's not patriotic to talk about your own country's foreign policy. Really? I mean, Somehow I get the feeling that I've gone back in a time machine and all of a sudden it's 1962. Or maybe it's because I'm on the East Coast. It, I mean, it could be a cultural, a coastal thing, okay? Because in California, where I'm from, well, actually, I'm from here originally, but it seems like there's a cultural kind of a thing going on. Or maybe it's New England, but this would never come up. And so I was kind of astonished by this when I first time. I'm like, really? You know, um, so nationalism, well, nationalism can be a good thing if it's, if it's turned inward. That is, if, if it's about we are celebrating America and how it's, you know, like unique. I mean, that was one of the things of my talk, is that the American character is very unique, that we are a revolution exemplary, and that's why it can't be exported by force, okay? But um, there are other forms of nationalism, mainly you know, like the European kind, for example, Prussian nationalism. Okay? And that started out in Prussia, which was a part of Germany, and Germany was disunited. There were many different states. Okay? There was you know, all these states, different German states. They all spoke the same language, but there were different governments, like hundreds of them. So they became nationalistic, and, that, and, and you know, German nationalism meant that Prussia had to conquer all these other states. So a lot of it has to do with history and even geography. But, but what I'm saying is, though, in, in nationalism, isn't it like my country do or die, my country's always right, I've got to go out because my, um, my country could never be wrong. But patriot, isn't patriotism more hey, nothing's perfect, but I'm an American, and I love my country. Right. And I, I don't mean, need to spread Americanism throughout the world, because you can't, like you said, you can't do that. I would agree with you. Uh, Mr. Armando, thank you so much for uh, for joining us and sharing your, uh, your thoughts with us. I'm an uh, anti-war supporter. Uh, really, really thrilled to see you speak in person. Um, my name is Bill. I'm a local, just a local private citizen. Um, you may not have seen the, the headlines because they only just came out kind of uh, you know late afternoon, early evening today. But the, the bipartisan commission on deficit reduction oh, did, yeah, uh, did. came out with its with its uh, recommendations and uh, actually included some you know fairly substantial uh, cuts to the military budget. Yeah. Um, I, I find that kind of uh, kind of heartening. And I, so I'm just wondering, uh, I have a question in in that vein, sort of what what do you see as the prospect uh, in the next few years for you know, kind of potentially kind of starving the beast, you know, reducing, uh, substantially reducing the budget for the military and thereby, you know, reducing this tendency toward this, you know, military aggressiveness, these wars of aggression. 
Um, do you think there's any prospect for that happening through the democratic process, or is it just, just going to come down to, you know, complete, absolute economic collapse and bankruptcy uh, that these wars are inevitably driving us toward? I mean, I would say, being a pessimist, that uh, it's it's going to take another kind of big crash, um, and I think that uh, the interests are are too strong. I mean. You know, every time you try and cut even any military base that even the Pentagon wants to cut. You know, like you have Robert Gates, who is now saying, look, we don't want all these expensive military, uh, you know, like programs. We don't want these, you know, like, there was a certain uh, 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 plane that uh, Congress wanted to build. I forget the, what the F. X-22. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, Congress wanted to build it. And Gates said, well, we don't need this. And plus the Pentagon is saying, you know what? We don't need this. But yet, Congress was insisting. So, and plus, like, you're never going to get, you're never going to get a different Congress because it's all gerrymandered. They, as, as Ralph Nader points out, they have arranged the districts, uh, you know, by which people, you know, elect, you know, members of Congress, it's all gerrymandered, right? you know. It's all rigged, and so it's all about money. And you know, you know Boeing, uh, you know Lockheed Martin. These guys have paid lobbyists in Washington. So what it's going to take is another big crash, and then maybe we can get political will. The will, uh, just if I can add, uh, the will ultimately might come from, for example, China or other creditor nations uh, may decide to just stop buying our treasuries and stop financing our wars for us. Am I, am I right? Well, if that happens, then we're going to have to cut a lot more than the military. I mean, then you're going to have a revolution in this country. People will, you know, like lose their welfare benefits. You do have, you know, right? I mean, if China did that, forget it. Because then we'd have zero money in the bank, and that that would be a disaster. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, we have two more. Just one uh, comment to that. Rand Paul did come out <coughs> recently and say so we should look at the military budget also. So there are some people now who are bringing this up, and uh, and I think uh, I think any rational person would look at it and say we have to reduce everywhere across everything if we're ever going to right the ship. So I'm an optimist. 